Remember that all objects have properties and methods. Collectively, these properties and methods are referred to as the object's members. PowerShell can actually add members to those that an object was born with. These are called type extensions. And you may not know it, but nearly every single object you've already worked with in PowerShell has a type extension or two. So we're going to look at how PowerShell put those there and how you can put your own. Now PowerShell's default extensions are stored in a file called types.ps1xml. This is a digitally signed XML file provided to you by Microsoft. Do not modify it. If you modify it, you will break Microsoft's digital signature and PowerShell will stop loading the entire file. That will make PowerShell itself stop working the way you're used to. So you don't want to do that. So inside this types.ps1 XML file, it specifies various types using their full type name and then specifies one or more extensions to that type. Let's take a look. Let's go into the shell, change to the root of the C drive, and run dir. Now, rather than looking at the directory, I'm going to pipe the results to get member. One of the two object types we get is a directory info object. In its last member is a script property called mode. This is a type extension. And if we switch over to Primal Script, where I've opened the types.ps1xml file that ships with Windows PowerShell, you'll see where that mode property is defined. The directory info object doesn't normally have a mode property. Instead, it has an attributes property, which is a set of binary flags. The mode property is added here in this XML file, and it translates those more difficult to work with binary tags into a clear text property that's much easier to work with. This is the power of type extensions. You can use them to correct shortcomings in the objects that PowerShell presents to you. An alias property creates a new name for an existing property. Usually this is done to improve consistency. In other words, making the count property available as length. Sometimes it's done for shorter. For example, on a process object, you may have noticed that you have a property called VM, which represents the virtual memory being used by the process. Well, the real property name is kind of overly long, so VM is a nice shorter way of working with it. Here's how it looks. Here's an example of an alias property attached to the Win32 process WMI class. Normally, this class has a property called name, but PowerShell adds an alias to that called process name. It also adds aliases called handles, VM, WS, and path. You can continue to access the original properties by their original names if you want, or you can use these alias properties. If we go into the shell and retrieve Win32 process from WMI, piping the objects to get member allows you to see the alias property entries as part of the member list. Type extensions can also include a default display property set, which defines the properties that PowerShell will display by default when displaying objects of a particular type. You can override this list, as you've learned in previous courses, by using select object or by using one of the format commandlets and specifying different properties. You'll notice that running a commandlet like get service doesn't display the full set of object properties by default. In the fundamentals course, you learned that PowerShell will instead use a set of default display properties if such a set exists. Here in the types.ps1xml file, I've located the type extensions for the service controller object class. Here you can see where a property set named default display property set is defined. This property set includes three properties, status, name, and display name, the properties which PowerShell displays by default for objects of this type. A note property defines a static value that is exposed as a property. And it's really not all that useful because it's a static value. In other words, it's hard coded into your XML file and it can't be changed. It only exists because it's used in several instances by Windows PowerShell as a kind of metadata. Little values that tell PowerShell itself different things with formatting or dealing with a particular object. So it's not an extension you're likely to use a bunch yourself. Here's one you are likely to use more yourself, script property. This is a property which, when accessed, executes PowerShell script code, code you can write yourself. You can provide a get block, which is executed when the property is read, and a put block, which is executed when the property is changed. You'll usually use the get block. In fact, a lot of times, the only thing defined will be the get block. 
Let's take a look. I showed you this example earlier, the directory info type. This time, I want to focus on what this script property is doing. Now, notice that it isn't going out to the network or to a database or to anywhere else to retrieve the information. It's simply performing a, a sort of calculation using an existing property of the directory info object. The dollar sign this variable refers to the current instance of the directory info type. That is, the actual object PowerShell is working with at the moment. The dollar sign this variable provides access to the object's normal properties, including the attributes property. After performing the calculation, you can see where the dollar sign CATR variable is being written to the pipeline. Although the write output commandlet isn't shown here, it is the default commandlet that's used by PowerShell, so it's sort of implied. By writing that value to the pipeline, the contents of dollar sign CATR become the value of the mode property. Now, kind of my perception of a property is that when you access it, PowerShell really just has to look up something that already exists locally. It doesn't have to go connect to another machine. It doesn't have to take any action. It's just, it's getting something that already exists. If it does need to take an action, maybe connect to another machine or perform a calculation or, or perhaps modify the object you have, that's called a script method. So a script method defines a PowerShell script code block and it's executed when the method is called. It returns data by writing it to the pipeline. In other words, within your script method, you would use write output to write the, the return value of that method. Within the method, you have a special variable called dollar sign this, and that represents the current object so that the method can actually access it and work with it. Here's what it looks like. It's a little harder to find an example of a script method in PowerShell's default types.ps1xml file. Script methods typically take some action. I like to think of them as verbs, which may involve accessing the network or a database or a file or something. Here's one associated with the system.management.managementObject type, which is an object type that provides the basis for all WMI classes in PowerShell. The method is named ConvertToDateTime, and it takes the strangely formatted dates and times from WMI objects that have date or time properties and converts them to an actual date time value. You'll notice that this method doesn't work with the dollar sign this variable, meaning it doesn't draw from the current object instance. Instead, it uses the args variable, meaning this method requires you to pass it a WMI date time property as an input parameter. The need to pass an input parameter is why this is defined as a method and not as a property. Properties cannot accept input arguments. Remember, though, that methods can use the dollar sign this variable to access the current object instance, even though this example doesn't do so. Next up is a property set. This is a predefined named set of properties, more than one. You might group them. For example, if you think there are several performance-related properties, you might create a property set called performance, and all those performance-related properties would become part of that set. Let's see what it looks like. We're on to the system.diagnostics.process object type for our last type extension example, property sets. Notice that this XML file defines a property set named PS configuration, which includes properties for name, ID, priority class, and file version. If I hop into the shell and run get process and pipe the results to get member, you can see the PS configuration property set. But what's in it? Well, let's run get process again this time using select object to only select the PS configuration property. This time, we see all the processes, but instead of the properties you're used to seeing in a table, you see the four properties defined by the property set. So a property set is a way of creating a group of properties which are related to one another and which you might commonly need to view. Notice here that I got an error too, indicating that PowerShell wasn't able to retrieve one of the properties from one of the processes on my computer. That's actually normal, and it happens because the idle process isn't a real process and doesn't have a priority class. If you want to create your own type extensions, you cannot modify the file provided by Microsoft. That file carries a Microsoft digital signature, and modifying the file in the least will break that signature, preventing the file from loading into the shell at all. Instead, you create your own PS1 XML file using the proper XML format. 
You can actually copy sections from Microsoft's file to use as a template if you want. You must refer to types by their full name, which you can discover by piping the object to get member. The type name is what tells PowerShell when to apply the type extension you create. Once your file is created, import it into the shell by using the update type data commandlet. Much like formatting data, you can prepend or append your data into the shell. Prepending allows you to override anything in PowerShell's default type extension file, while appending allows you to tack on new data but allows PowerShell to win any conflicts with its built-in data. As with format data, your type extensions are not persistent. When you close the shell, your type extensions go away. So if you want them to be loaded each time you open the shell, you'll need to put the update type data command into your PowerShell profile. I'm running the update type data command to load my custom type file into the shell. You'll find this file on your disk if you want to follow along or try this on your own. After doing so, I create a simple string and then I pipe it to get member. There's a couple of new properties here, including character count, which is an alias property to the built-in length property. Using character count, I can see that it returns a length, and using length, I can see that it provides the same value. Here's the XML for my simple type extension. I set this to work for the system.string type, and I created an alias property named character count, which references the built-in length property. Okay, here's my big XML warning again. Remember, XML tag names and tag attributes are case sensitive. A lowercase g is not the same as an uppercase g. Messes me up every time. I recommend you use the built-in files that Microsoft gives you. Take a copy of them. Don't modify them. Use those as a template. They've already got everything properly uppercased and lowercased, and it'll keep you from messing up, which really takes a long time to track down. Remember, if just one letter is in the wrong case, PowerShell will refuse to load the entire file, and you can imagine how frustrating that becomes. Pause this video and take some time to complete this lab. Use the lab guide included on this disk to guide you through the lab tasks. When you're finished, resume this video and I'll present a sample solution. You'll also find hints and solutions right in your lab guide. You'll find my sample PS1 XML file on your disk. I load it into the shell using update type data, prepending my new type extensions into the shell. Now let's see it in action. I'm piping a string to get member to see my new members. Then I'll create a string, localhost, and use the responding method to ping it. I'll do the same thing for unreachable to show that it returns false too. For task two, I'm creating a string and checking the isUNC property to see if I get a true, and then doing it again to see if I get a false for a string that clearly isn't a UNC. Here's the XML for these type extensions. I set up a responding as a script method. The script uses WMI to ping whatever string is stored inside the current string instance. You can see where I use the dollar sign this variable to access the contents of the current instance. Of course, this assumes the string contains a name or an IP address, and if it doesn't, this method isn't very useful. If the status code property from Win32 ping status as class is zero, I write true to the pipeline. Otherwise, I write false and those become the output of the method. Next is the isUNC script property. I'm simply comparing the current string accessed through the dollar sign this variable to a regular expression by using the dash match operator. The match operator will output true or false, so that gets written to the pipeline as the value of my isUNC property.